Hello and welcome to the Slackware Arm podcast, season three, episode six. I'm Stuart Winter, the platform architect for Slackware on the Arm platform. And we have with us Brent Earl, who's the Slackware contributor and has been helping with the Arm port now for a couple of years. Hi, Brent. Hello. Well, so in this episode, what we thought we'd do is because there have been a few questions about people wanting to compile their own kernels or, you know, make changes to the kernel in Slackware ARX64. What we thought we'd do is show you how you can accomplish that using the Slackware ARM build system. So instead of taking a kernel, you know, just taking the Linux kernel source from kernel.org and changing the config and building it yourself, in Slackware ARM and, and ARX64, everything's fully integrated and the system expects a, a package that conforms to the, um, the standard. So um, inside of the kernel build script uh, for Slackware ARM, there's a whole manner of different things that set up the kernel package so that it works properly across the board. And so uh, it's not as easy as just building a kernel and slotting it in uh, manually. It's actually much easier to rebuild the full kernel package with your own custom tweaks than it is to try and pull it off manually. It's just not worth it. It's a lot easier to use the official scripts and just change the config as you see fit. So. Um, what we're going to do here, Brent's uh, made a video of of doing of uh, of compiling uh, a kernel himself a few days ago. So what we're going to do is walk through that, um, and Brent's going to show us what he's done. So I'm going to I'm going to press play. And oh, unless, do you want to introduce anything first, Brent, about what you how you've uh, how you've set this up or anything? Yeah, I mean, I I've just set up like uh, a Linux container and basically made all of the source code and packages available through uh, bind mounts in the container. And then I just run my commands within the container. I'll have to worry about like the integrity or anything being wrong on my, you know, my build machine, so. Okay, so you've created a separate environment on, a, on, a, on one of your native built, you know, your native ARM machines in which yeah. you can build this kernel. Um, so that, mm -hmm. that means you don't need to, you know, pollute the, the sort of live system, if you like. Exactly, yeah. And, or, and vice versa, have the build system pollute the device, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the system that you're, you're using. For me, um, so Brent's gonna show you how he's done that. Uh, also, you'll find in the Slackware ARH64 source directory, you'll find a readme underscore source uh, text file, which explains how you can set this up. Um, I've set it up slightly differently how to how Brent did. I've been actually doing some experimentation on my Raspberry Pi 4 that is not set up as a build machine. Um, it's just a standard installation and I've and I've just um, followed the commands in that script in that uh, text file. And uh, you can do it that way too. Um, but again, if you want to be able to uh, create an isolated environment, you can do it the way Brent's done it. Um, either way works fine. So what I'll do is let's press play and uh, you can talk us through what's uh, what's going on. So I'm connecting out to the uh, build machine where I have my containers running. Just uh, this is just what I do when I build stuff. Okay, so you build everything under screen, right? I can see. Yeah, I can see it. Oh no, I mean you're build. So you're building everything under screen, so you can leave it and walk away. Yeah, exactly. Or like my network connection goes down or whatever. So yeah. Okay, yeah, I do the same. I, leave, I run all of the builds in the screen as well. And so you just switch to the root user there with su dash. And, uh, yeah. And that X compiler's the uh, one that I clone fresh okay. every time I build something. So, and there I'm just typing the wrong command. I think it was marked unexecutable, that's why. Uh, so once that starts up, then I just enter the container and show show a few of the things that I look at before I start. And you can see in the root directory, I have a bunch of uh, sim links to where my um, the files that are needed for running the build system. 
Uh, okay. That way I don't, I don't have to like move them around or anything. So. Okay. So on the in the README source file that I mentioned earlier, you can see it's done differently to this. You 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 can you don't have to. Uh, you can actually store the um, the directories inside of root's home directory. That's how it's. That's how it's suggested to be done because it's faster. It's easier that way. But yeah. so you've got you've got are these slash home slash mirror. Is that a bind mount within your LXC or something? Yeah, it just exposes that directory to the container. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you okay? So the container is basically as if I'm running on my build, like without a container, uh, but everything else is isolated. I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Okay, so you keep your... copying files. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you've copied. Okay. So you, okay. So what we're we doing here then? I'm just looking at that to make sure before I start building uh, the right kernel version or whatever. Yeah. So you need to make sure that the kernel version in that in that build script there is set. Or uh, in that launch script is set properly, or rather it matches that one. Yeah. I'm just making sure I have the right config file. <laughs> and I am going to uh, forget what I'm doing here. I think I'm just copying the config in and making sure that the source matches and stuff. So. Okay. Oh, that's right. I added in zswap just as an example of what you something you might want to edit when you rebuild the kernel. Okay. So you've copied here where it says you've copied this kernel, you copied the config dash arm v8, uh, which is the Slackware ARC64 kernel config file to dot config, which is what the Linux kernel build system uses. That's the config file name it uses when it's uh, when it's building. So you've copied that there. Yeah. Is this the standard one you've copied here? Or is it? Yeah, it's I think I had just done a fresh R sync, so it was default. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so all right, so you've 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 uh, got the you're using the source code in user SRC Linux. Uh, presumably that's from the kernel source package, is it? In the Slack way. Yeah, yeah it is. And that's just sitting inside the container. It's not the on the uh, ah. build host. Yeah. Okay. So it's right. independent. Okay. So then you're running make menu config, which is the Linux kernel configuration, one of the Linux kernel configuration menu systems. Yeah. There is another one called, um, is it nconfig or something like that? It's a slightly different version. X, I think it's xconfig, but. Well, there's an x one, but there's also an nconfig. There's a different version oh. of this one. Oh, I've I didn't know that. I've used it for years. Yeah, there's a different one. I'll use this one too myself. All right, so you're going to change a couple of options here. You said you're going to enable uh, uh, Z -swap. swap, basically better swaps swap files. So, uh, and I didn't really change anything else. It's just all the defaults that come with the kernel. I just enabled it. Okay. Yeah. So this is just an example of something you might want to change in the kernel. So you just change the kernel config. All right. Yeah, and then I just search to see if I got everything I wanted type of thing. Okay. But uh, you had a good look. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was just making sure I, I what I was gonna yeah. do next basically. I do that too. I page up and page down, and then and then kind of. When you look at it uh, for, uh, from someone else's point of view, you think, why don't you just read it all? I mean, actually, you don't do it like that. Do you jump up and down and read it? That's how I do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's funny. Right. Now I'm just updating the config in the in the build directory uh, for okay. the kernel source. You don't have to do this part. <laughs> but oh, know. I didn't know that. I just kind of oh, well, cover all my bases. Okay, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're running it, okay. Yeah, you can do that if you aren't going to use the new um, uh, build script options. You you have to do it like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did the, I did this before the new build script options. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And in here, I just do a silly edit so that I don't have to give myself a headache copying files around. <laughs> 
okay. But yeah, you could just copy it as it, as you already had it. Instead. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't know why I did this. I changed it already in the kernel config, so. Yeah, you, you, I was thinking that. Yeah, you didn't read to. You didn't need to do any of that at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, so I got was... Nef Netflix running, and I'm listening to music, and <laughs> t taking my time. <laughs> all right. So this this script here, dbuild, is a. Um, <laughs> it's basically a, it's a wrapper script for the arm slash build script. Um, yeah. I should probably pause that and explain what that is. So inside this Slackware ARM build system, you see on the screen here, you've got uh, a few different directories, one of which, well, the second one here is uh, at the bottom on the left, is called ARM. And it, so originally, this Slack kit package, uh, which is now in the uh, Slackware um, ARH64 official repository, it's in a D series. Originally, this Slack kit package was actually what I called the Slackware porting project, because I also had the idea to port Slackware to everything. So I had a number of different architectures readily available uh, in, a, in a server room that no one wanted anymore. So I had lots of uh, like Alpha, I had Spark, I had uh, some other uh, HP UX, uh, not HP UX, some HP machine that no one cared about running HP UX on anymore. So I had this idea to port Slackware to everything. I don't know why. I think it's just something that people get excited about from time to time. So originally inside the Slack kit package is going to be ARM and then the other architecture names and inside their respective directories we're going to be um, files or assets or whatever that pertains to a particular architecture. That's why it's done that way. Um, usually though there's just a script called build in the ARM directory and not much else. Uh, but that's why that, that's why it's like that. And this dbuild script we were just looking at is um, a it means distributed build. And it, it's just a wrapper script for this arm slash build script that basically just sets up using distcc to cross compilers, usually on x86 64s. Well, I think you're using arm as, as well, aren't you? Yeah, your... it's, it's building natively in the container, so I don't have to mess around with the other stuff. Uh, but I do have one x86 machine running uh, the uh, tool chain for dbuild. So. Right. Okay. So you're going to use dbuild here. I, I, you can just use dot slash arm slash build as well okay. um, without without using a, a cross compiler with this CC. So let's continue the video here. This is like the director's cut, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you're running dbuild here and this will then call the arm slash build script and kick off the kernel build. Now I've seen that message, did you wipe the old kernel? I'm going to remove that message now from the, from the build system because that was for the old days. The build orchestration system deletes all the old kernel configs. And here I'm just relaunching uh, DISCC on the host outside of the container. OK. So yeah, because I forgot to start it up. I had just rebooted or something. So. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Yeah, and starting. then you'll see it picks up the right a number of jobs again. Oh, I see. It jumps up to thirty six. Thirty six. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it won't yeah. take too long then. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. So I've, I was doing this on the my. Um, uh, Raspberry Pi yesterday, uh, and it's uh, doing it all natively. So it's only got six, uh, no, rather, it's got four cores, hasn't it, for the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, yeah. And it took several hours to build the kernel. <laughs> I just wanted to see what, what it was like to build it natively. Yeah. Okay, so the Slackware ARM build system is now running inside of your container and it's unpacking the Linux source. It's applying a uh, a bunch of patches. Just like the stock patches that you've, you've yeah. uh, provided for people. Yeah. OK. And 
And I think at some point here, I, uh, yeah, there we go. Just to show that it's distributing the build to other machines. So it's starting, <laughs> yeah. So on the left, it's it, it's starting to build the kernel now. There we go. Yeah, and on your right hand side, you've got the DCC monitor, so we can see what compile jobs are coming through. Yeah. Just for people, it's something to look at. You know, you're sitting there watching <laughs> it compile. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it like the Matrix? Don't you just stand there and watch? You know, like letters. <laughs> fly through the screen and be just yeah. standing in awe. <laughs> yeah. And I know exactly what it's doing the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what happens now? Is this good? How, how much of this? Uh, I edited it at some point that, you know, it goes to the next part. Oh, okay. Kind of jumps around. All right. I so, just wanted uh, to show that part. OK. So people have an idea of what will be happening on their system if they set it up. Yeah, okay. So if people are interested in this, as I've started hacking around with the Raspberry Pi kernel, the, uh, the kernel fork, um, with the intention of making a little wrapper script to uh, do this um, as well, but you can just build it natively, so you don't need any containers or anything. Um, and it, it'll build you a, a Slackware package from the Raspberry Pi kernel fork, to which you can then upgrade package um, and reboot and have the Raspberry Pi kernel fork instead. So I'm not going to supply the, any packages myself. Uh, that is not going to happen um, for a few different reasons, but if you want to compile it yourself, you'll be able to just run a script and you know follow a few instructions and then build your own package. And because it only takes really several hours now and, and less um, in some cases, then uh, really it's not a big deal anymore. I mean, people used to build kernels on like you know 50 megahertz <laughs> uh, x86 is back in the day, and it used to take you know 16 hours or more. So I think just having several hours building a kernel is is perfectly acceptable. For, People and you get to play around with the Slackware on build system as well. So I think it's um that's pretty good. You know, I was quite surprised, Brent, when I so I took the Raspberry Pi kernel fork uh, and did a um a I took the Slackware ARM kernel config and did a make old config inside the kernel fork of the Raspberry Pi. And I was yeah. absolutely shocked at how much more hardware support there is that they have not they haven't upstreamed, even now. Yeah. It's been years. I was abs absolutely shocked. I've never seen anything yeah. like that. in It's the a lot of the like uh, add on boards like the Pi hats and stuff that they yeah. have video yeah. stuff and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it's not to my liking, though. I, I don't you know, that's um, oh, you got a, you got a failure up there. Oh, that was my x86. Something didn't compile on it, but it picked up on the other machines. Oh, OK. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Yeah, I was really surprised about the Raspberry Pi kernel. I didn't expect there to be so much extra support, but you know, to me, that's just not how you play with the with the open source system. I mean, most vendors have their own kernel for a while, while they stabilize everything, but they don't keep it separate for so long. Yeah, um, it seems like it's a lot of extra work. Yeah, to do that, but it's a very strange business model. I mean, it'd be better just getting getting all of their patches into the mainline kernel and just having other people run regular distros, you know, Slackware, for example, or Fedora or Arch or whatever, you know, Debian or whatever, run the official version using the mainline kernel and let people use the open source distributions. That's what open source is about. It's not about making it not about making your own hardware and making a distribution like Apple do or something like that. I mean, it's just yeah. not it's not it's not how we roll here with Slackware. And it's not how the other distributions roll either. So I was a bit disappointed to see that there were so there's so much still left, um, you know, it's not been mainlined yet, but, you know, at least at least for the core components, though, it's just video that's it's a bit, uh, well, it, it still isn't great right now, at least with Linux 5.18, but 
yeah um but again yeah so i'll, I'll once if there's interest in that i'll i'll uh finish hacking up the raspberry pi kernel fork and you'll be able to build your own slackware packages using that um i've already done it in fact i've already rebooted into it but i was using the default uh raspberry pi or bcm2 was it bcm2711 default config um mm -hmm. and it's non-standard it has non-standard serial port um, it has uh, missing loads of modules that i have uh, in slackware arch64 so i've done something crazy i've taken the uh I took the Raspberry Pi kernel fork of, of Linux 5.18.7 and I applied all of those patches that from, which are basically for the Pi 64 boards. I applied all of them to the Raspberry Pi kernel fork and they all applied cleanly. And then I did a, I took the Slackware ARM kernel config, did a make old config, said yes to a couple of the video stuff and no to everything else. And um, I'm, I'm going to see how that turns out because that'd be really cool if that's all you need to do because that makes it so much easier. Um, yeah. And that way, you've got a full, fully compatible um, kernel package that works with the operating system, initial RAM disk manager, and everything else. And you just upgrade package to them, and it just works. So uh, I think people will appreciate that. And then they get to they get to look at stuff scrolling off the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, you can never have too much of that, can you, Brent? No. no. Yeah. Speaking of which, though, I'm tempted to sort of slide on a little bit forward into the future in the video. Well, it right? skips ahead in a minute here. It starts building the modules and skips ahead. Yeah, we're building the modules now. Yeah. I just feel like I was just filling, you know. <laughs> it's like the yeah. DJs, when, when something goes wrong technically, they just start talking about stuff. <laughs> which I always thought was pretty, uh, was quite a good skill, actually, if you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> But you'll notice, like the uh, sometimes one of the machines doesn't compile. It's usually the x86. Yeah. Uh, I think it's because there's not enough bandwidth. I'm on Wi-Fi on it, so. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I've seen that myself too. I've never really looked into it. Yeah. Well, and the important thing is, it has to say like after the error, it's going to re recompile and it'll do it locally yeah. and it, it succeeds. So. Yeah. Exactly. Just in case anybody's doing this at some point and they see those errors, they don't have to kill the build or anything. All right. So this skips ahead at some point, but the video is only 20 minutes or something. So. Okay. So and I believe I cut some of it out in between, so it's really not as fast as this looks. But. No. <laughs> so even so, on the master build machine, it takes. Uh, all in all, it takes, I think, just over four hours uh, to build all the kernel, all of the kernel packages, the source package, modules, kernel itself, and the headers, and the two uh, SD card images for the Pine, um, Pine 64 stuff and the uh, Raspberry Pi. So it takes four hours all in all, and that's using disk CC to uh, several x86 hosts as well. But yeah, natively it's still going to be it's going to be several hours more than that. But right, so the modules are still doing modules, 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 more modules, yeah. more modules, modules, modules. Oh, here we go. It's installing the uh, headers, headers now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. It's bit. really fast, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can see the compile jobs have dropped off now because it's not compiling anything anymore. Yeah. Um. Okay. And so that's how long it took to compress stuff. What was that, that kind of one? You have to scroll back a little. What was that? That's oh, the 20... compressed part. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It takes a while to compress. And now it's installing the uh, stuff for the RAM disk and stuff yeah. like that. That goes pretty fast too. Just kind of stop for a second to show people what it's doing, have an idea. As they build it, they can see stuff going on. Yeah, it's quite verbose, the build system, uh, so that I can, if there are issues with it, I can look at the logs and see what's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so at the moment, it's just basically building the initial, the content of the initial RAM disk, or the OS init ID, as I call it. Yeah. God, I remember writing all the build script code for that. That was a lot of work. Um, yeah, 
And I definitely might recommend if people have time to look over it before they run it. I always do that usually just to make sure. Yeah. Uh, but like one thing that you want to make sure is if you have uh, in your root directory the kernels and the ISO Linux uh, directories from the Slack root tree because it will fail when it's trying to build the RAM disk. It won't be able to find the kernel and the installer will build. Um, yeah, if you if you follow the readme source, I'll show it. Yeah, I'll show that uh, after we're done here. If you follow the readme source and you just you know you follow the instructions, you'll have everything you need anyway. Yeah. So it's yeah. uh, so that's all good. It's all sorted out. So it's installing the what are these the DTV yeah the device tree blobs, yeah. which is the map of the hardware, and then it's built now the it's kernel package and the modules. And the package. kernel modules. All right. Between the compression and the permission changes on the uh, kernel module packages, it uh, takes a long time. That's why that's skipped out. Yeah, it, it does. And then building the kernel source package as well. What I yeah. might do in the if there's demand for it in the kernel dot slack build for this, I might add some extra options that you can, uh, pr you know, bypass building certain packages. Well, two packages: the kernel headers and the kernel source. Because usually, you wouldn't need to do that. And if you, even if you, for example, you want to build your own kernel, uh, whether it's a Raspberry Pi fork kernel source or from the, the you know the mainline kernel source like we're doing here. As long as you keep it within the same um, major release, you know, for example, 5.18, as long as you keep it within the same major release as the official Slackware packages, you won't really go wrong anyway. And you won't need the kernel source and you won't need the kernel headers packages usually. Can't imagine yeah. you really would. Unless there's something for the Raspberry Pi in particular, there's something that requires some particular header or something like that in, in the, that's only present in the Raspberry Pi kernel fork, but probably not. But um, yeah, so I'll probably add in some options at some point to be able to control whether you create those. Because it's, it's, it's just because it takes ages to, to build those pack, to build the kernel source package, that's all, because it's massive. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you don't need it. It compresses it a lot. And that was it. And that was it. So, yeah, I built the kernel source and it was good to go. <laughs> okay. All right, so the only thing you didn't show in there was um, upgrading the packages that you built. Yeah, yeah. But um, that's fine. So, OK, so I've gone to the FTP site for uh, Slackware ARM and I've gone into the Slackware ARM directory into the Slackware ARC64 current repo. So if you go to the source directory here, you'll see a file here called readme underscore source. If you click on that, this explains how to set this up. And you'll see it's pretty straightforward. So you can do what Brent's done with, with a container if you want to go that route. Or you can have, so if you have, if you take a default installation, let's put this up a little bit actually. Oh, that's better. If you take a default installation of Slackware AR64, if you follow these steps exactly like this, um, the only thing I've got to point out for this, just for the kernel, if you're only going to build the kernel package or rebuild the kernel package, you do not need to sync the, the Slackware x86-64 tree. It's only if you want to rebuild any other package in Slackware ARM. Um, but anyway, if you follow all of these instructions like this, uh, you would be able to uh, get this set up. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So at this point, for example, with the kernel, instead of CDing into the bash source directory, you just CD into the source slash K and then do dot slash arm slash build and use some of the instructions that Brent's done as well. So yeah, it's really straightforward. Um, if there's interest in it, we can just write up a really short document of just exactly how to rebuild the kernel. It's very straightforward. It's only a few commands off of the default yeah. install. Um, and then if there's interest later, I can make a little script that just uses the Raspberry Pi kernel fork as well and builds packages of that if people really want that. Um, so let us know in the comments if you want to do that. Or rather, if you want us to do that, <laughs> uh, we can do that too. That's all we need to show you in this one. So yeah, let us know if, in the comments if you like a little document of just how to do that, just for reference. And uh, we can put one together, it won't take too long. All right. Well, cheers, Brent. Well, we'll see you in the next video, guys. All right, That's see ya. It. See you later.